So this is the story of how I got to where I am today. Most of it takes place right here in New York City, but actually, this is where it all got started. Dropping that needle in the groove, listening to my albums, I was dreaming of making those sounds myself. I was probably listening to Super Tramp here. But I didn't have an ounce of musical talent as far as I knew, and I didn't even own any instruments. And I was going to make this face until I got an electric guitar. Later that Christmas, my brother-in-law gave me his old electric guitar, and I was going to take some lessons. It was an old Stratocaster knockoff called Raven, and I loved it. I did take some lessons, and by my sophomore year of high school, I had started a band. Early on, we had enough rudimentary knowledge to start writing some decent songs. We called ourselves The Vitals. For as green as we were, we were actually pretty good. All I cared about back then, though, was getting to this stage, CBGB. We didn't know it at the time, but we were going to have to wait a lot more years before we got there. Because in 1986, I was pretty much kidnapped to go off to college. I didn't want to, but I did. Because my father was a professor and a college administrator, and he was able to get me a free ride. And this is him handing me my degree in 1991. He said, get your degree first, and then you can do whatever you want. I did what he said, and I'm glad that I did, but the first thing I did when I got up to Erie, Pennsylvania was get in a rock band. It was a cover band mostly, but we did some originals as well. It was called Tantrum. I really didn't like doing covers though, so by my sophomore year, I started this band. It was called Orchard's Madness. It was space rock or stoner rock meets what I can only now call grunge. But graduation was quickly approaching, and New York City was calling my name again. My friends John and Alex, from The Vitals, came up to visit me in Erie. We recorded some demos of some new original songs which we knew we were going to take back to New York. Shortly thereafter, I did move back to New York. With the new songs and some of the old ones, me, John, Alex, and a new bass player decided to make another go of it as The Vitals. After only a few months of gigging in New York City, our new bass player quit to join a new band. But our demos got the interest of a management company called Wild Justice. They wound up offering us a management and production deal, but also the first thing they wanted to do was change our name and change our sound. We wound up signing that deal, but the first thing we had to do was find a new bass player. The first bass player we found was a guy named John Helwig. He was awesome. He had the best stage presence of all of us, and he actually, coincidentally, knew our new managers. With him on bass and a whole new sound, we changed our name to Zen Bender. We had played CBGBs as the Vitals, but now we were going to showcase there regularly. And that was a big dream come true. Wild Justice Management recorded our debut album, and they paid for the whole thing. Like I said though, they wanted to change our sound. We had been heavy, groovy, stoner rock, but they wanted us to fully commit to a heavier, grunge sound. And that's exactly what we did for the debut album. We had some challenges though. This was now 1994. And by that time, the grunge craze had already spawned too many Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains sound-alikes. And by the time all the major labels had given us a good look, we were already branded too derivative. But we kept at it anyway. We played the New York scene as often as we could, probably too much. We loved the songs, we loved performing, we were really tight, we sounded great, but we were still relatively unknown and it felt like we were going nowhere. By 1996, we were looking for a new bass player again. We found somebody new, and we were ready to forge ahead, but the attention from Wild Justice Management was starting to wane. And sure enough, 
Shortly thereafter, they dropped us and picked up the band Days of the New instead. Despite that setback, we took ourselves back into the studio and recorded a follow-up EP entitled Unlearning. We did a bunch of regional shows to support it too, but time was running thin for us. Before the year was out, we lost Matt, our new bass player, as well as John, my longtime friend and guitarist. He was a major part of our sound. There was no going forward without him, so when he called it quits, that was the end of Zenbender. But me and my drummer Alex were not ready to give up. I even thought about playing bass myself. I loved playing bass, but I couldn't play bass and sing. I had been the lead guitarist and lead singer in Zenbender up until this point, but I started feeling that all I really wanted to do was sing. As much as I didn't like doing covers in that original cover band I was in, I was just the singer. And I had remembered it being kind of a nice thing not to have to grunt or stress over a guitar rig. With that in mind, along with our continued determination, another reinvention was in the works. In short order, Alex and I did the only thing you could do back in the day in New York City when you were looking for bandmates. We put an ad in the Village Voice for a guitarist and a bass player. That ad was answered by these two guys, Trace and Jamie, and they became the next chapter. The new incarnation was called As It Is, spelled with an S on the end originally. We had to change it to a Z many years later in order to release our legacy album because some band had stolen our name. Trace, Alex, myself, and Jamie began writing new songs together immediately. We recorded some demos pretty quickly, and those demos landed us a recording deal with a Canadian record company which we found out much later on was wrought with corruption. We were actually a part of this CBC documentary about the label's corruption and all the bands it had ripped off. It was an interesting and tragic chapter in our musical journey. The greatest thing about it was the music that we made, even though it was all so short-lived. We did our best to keep it going, but Trace and Jamie lived in upstate New York and Alex and I were based in New York City. We played a lot of shows, both in the city and upstate. We knew we had made some really great music together. The chemistry was undeniable, but we were running out of steam. And unfortunately, I had also gotten some very bad news that my father was suffering from cancer. And it was at that point that I started down a long, dark road. Despite having made some really great music together, that dark road lasted longer than anyone wanted it to. Struggling with depression and grief, anxiety and addiction, I took myself out of the game. I was at a place where I could no longer do the very thing that had defined who I was anymore. So I stopped and I went to get the help that I needed. That became the start of my journey in recovery, and my new focus became career and family. And I was all about it. And as much as I loved and embraced it, I knew that deep down there was a big part of me that was missing, and I was going to have to find it again. 